Welcome. You all having a good conference? Looking forward to the party? Good. So this session is entitled DevOps Notes from the Field. Uh, I'm James O'Neill. Uh, my contact details are up there. Uh, I worked for Microsoft for quite a long time and then uh, I uh, spent a couple of years working for a Formula One team and I'm now working for myself. Uh, so when people ask what the modular bit is, modular is a thing very similar to a manta ray. Um, and that's the uh, reason you'll see references to flatfish around when I, when I run my demos. Now, it's traditional that a, a show starts with a, uh, an agenda slide. Um, I'm going to break with tradition, and I'm going to go straight into the demo. The reason for this is, while you were arriving, uh, I was setting up a brand new virtual machine. The, the early arrivals will have seen this machine boot up for the very first time. Nobody's ever logged into it. I don't even know what name's been assigned to it in the, in the Windows boot up process. I know the image it was built from. I know the honor 10.xml that was used to build it. And Hyper-V has very kindly told me that it's got this IP address ending in 84. Now I've got another virtual machine over here. It happens to be a domain controller. And I'm using this to push out my DSC configuration. So you can see up here we have the name of the machine. It's going to be called Warwick Node. It's going to join a cluster. Uh, MES, when you see that a couple of times in the presentation, the system I've been building is what's known as a manufacturing execution system. So those, those are the references to MES. We've got some iSCSI connections to make clustering work easily on a demo system, some cluster parameters and some software packages we're going to install. Now, in, when we do this for real, there are about 14 packages here. I'm just trying to keep this simple and just install one of the packages that's part of the, the manufacturing execution system. So I'm just going to kick off the uh, DSC part of this, and I'm just going to shrink this part up so that we can see a bit more of it. Now, this contains both a long pause and an error, usually. So um, I'm not going to panic if this uh, stops for a few seconds and says, um, uh, I'm doing something, but just, just be patient. So what we've done already is we've built a MOF file for this new machine. We've also built uh, a test file to go with it. And we've copied, you can just see about three lines up from the bottom there, we've copied about 1,000 files over there that are things that this machine will need. OK? Um, we've noticed that we don't have to update PowerShell. Uh, this obviously matters a lot, because if you look there, it comes up three times in the space of five lines. And what is now happening is the machine's actually creating a certificate and assigning that certificate to um, DSC. Now, this is the bit that I have to kind of explain a little bit and just stand here. So while that's happening, you may have noticed already there is a bit of a DSC focus. I need to tell you a little bit about the background to this session, um, because Richard Sidway up the front here, our, our content manager, uh, was reminding me that I had said I would speak at this conference when I was tied up with an awful lot of family strife. And I said to Richard, Oh, I, I can do a session for you. I can do it. What I'm doing at, at, at the moment is quite interesting. So I can do something that's sort of notes for the from the field from this DevOps role that I've got. And so I think Richard put in DevOps notes from the field as a placeholder. And some of the alternative and witty titles for this presentation kind of went by the board. So it's not called How I Built a Monster, though it might very well be. <laughs> uh, it's not called Upgrading to Mediocre, although it might very well be. Um, it's not even called How I Stopped Worrying and Learned to Love Thousand Line Moth Files. So, <laughs> and trust me, the moth files are big. So, the machine that we, we're starting with, uh, you can see there, it didn't have a proper DNS. It's figured out where its DNS should be. It's now trying to join the domain. And this is where I said this ends with an error, because if I go and minimize this, we should find that the machine called Warwick has just rebooted. You can just see it there in Hyper-V Manager. 
and you can see it's just coming up again. So it's joined the domain, it's rebooting, it's going to do a bunch of interesting stuff, we hope. So, I've explained how we came by the, the title of Notes from the Field. Um, I said I was involved in a lot of family strife, um, which is an odd way of leading on to talking about my sister. Uh, but my sister is actually a professor of computer science down in California. And she gave me this quote, which she tells her students when they're going to do a presentation. And this has been worrying me ever since I started putting this presentation together. Because, yeah, I did something, and I want to show someone, and maybe I just ought to tell my mum. So I hope you're going to care a bit more, because trying to explain this to my mum might be a bit on the tough side. So the agenda proper... Like most notes from field sessions, we're going to look at what was the problem, how did we solve it, and what did, it, what did we learn on the back of that. Um, just a little bit of my opinionated stuff as a preamble to that. I keep seeing the same thing in the last four different places I've been. You know, there's, there's an old joke, and it goes something like, there's a balloonist and he's lost. And he descends and he sees some people below playing golf. And he shouts down, where am I? And the golfer shouts back, you're halfway down the 17th fairway. And he says, you work in IT, don't you? Mm. Yes, says the golfer, how did you know? Well, the information you gave me is 100% accurate and totally blooming useless. But somebody added a two-line ap appendix to that old joke. And that goes, and the golfer yelled back, and you work in management, don't you? Well, yes, says the balloonist. How did you work that out? Well, says the golfer, you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, and now it's my fault. <laughs> and I've been in one organisation where if you said to them, what services are we delivering? you got a blank look. If you said, to whom? Oh, we don't know who uses that file server. You can't shut that one down. It might be used by, and there's a long story I can tell about that. I went to another organization, and I, was, I made myself very popular there because I drew a Visio diagram. <laughs> and that Visio diagram captured all the servers that were used in delivering the service that these guys were supporting. And the previous Visio was about four years old. And this, the fact that I captured everything, they loved it. Um, if any of you bumped into me earlier on in the week and I was wearing a T-shirt with some PowerShell on it, one of the guys there bought me that PowerShell T-shirt. They, they really liked it. And we don't know what state machines are in and how they got there. And this is really one of the things that um, has been the biggest frustration of the, of the place where I'm now working, which is... Um, uh, Jaguar Land Rover. How do we get there? Well, if you've heard of optimism bias, we always think we can do it more quickly than we really can. Um, and what then happens is we get rewarded by what we're seen to deliver. So we have to be seen to deliver everything, and we can't be late, and we know that adding more resources late in a project will just make things later. So we carry technical debt forward. Um, one, of the, one of the first things that goes on the technical debt pile is um, documentation. Right? I've also seen part of the cause being very poor management of vendors. Um, that you tell a vendor to do something, they don't actually give you a proper record of what they did, how, and so on. I see lots of nodding around the room. Like I say, IT people just don't like doing the, doing the documentation. And there's a running joke in, in the place that I work, which is the last line up there. We're agile. We don't do documentation. Um, and, yeah, it, it, it is a problem. So, to automation. Jeffrey talked a lot about automation. If you automate a mess, what do you get? You just get a mess more quickly. So I'm, my kind of 
agenda when it comes to DevOps is that it needs to be more than just doing it fast, right? It needs to be doing it better. Now, you know, all know the old triangle, don't you? You can have good, fast, or cheap, okay? I want to do good and fast, and I don't want to be cheap, okay? I joke that I'm not a freelance, I'm a mercenary, so I want those two things. And if we're doing this much vaunted infrastructure as code, then what we want to be capturing is what we got, ideally why and on who say so, and how it got there. And I don't like infrastructure as code, because when I talk to management, management hear code and they all kind of do this. What management, what do management understand? Money, Money yes. Money. No. There's a thing on the end there. No. Excel files. <laughs> Give it to them as a PowerPoint or in Excel, and actually you make some progress. So my joke for this is I do infrastructure as a spreadsheet. <laughs> okay. What brought me into this job was they wanted repeatability. Okay. So what repeatability did they want? I mentioned this thing, MES, this manufacturing execution system. I'm working for Jaguar Land Rover. The manufacturing ex execution system basically takes all the orders for cars and says, right, this car is going down the production line now. It needs this seat put in. It needs this different stereo. It needs this and this and this. And it tells the people beside the production line what they're supposed to do. It's made up of a lot of very complicated bits of software produced by GE. And then on top of that, we have stuff that Jaguar Land Rover code in-house. And we need to put that software stack onto servers that have been built for us by our offshore vendor. I say offshore vendor very, very carefully because they are also the owner of Jaguar Land Rover. Jaguar is owned by Tata. Tata Motors is the Jaguar bit. Tata Consulting Services is one of the, the world's big... Um, outsourcing vendors. Um, because of their culture, a lot of their philosophy is not to automate stuff, but to solve problems by adding labor. And that isn't always helpful. So we need to build that on servers that they've built. We also need to build, and, and by the way, we're not allowed to build the production servers or to set up clustering. Um, the um, adding the cluster name to Active Directory is something that's reserved for certain people within um, the IT department. We have to build test environments, um, and we might be um, building our own domains and our own SQL servers in those test environments. The SQL servers might need to be clustered, so might the application servers. And those test environments might be on Hyper-V or VMware or in one of those wonderful master strokes, they decided they'd put some of these in the cloud and they'd use Google Cloud. No, I don't know why either. Um, Azure, I could have understood. Amazon Web Services, I could have understood. Google Cloud, I still don't understand why. But we have to work in that environment. And then those images have to be portable and so they have to follow all the corporate standards. And they said to me, we built one of the pre-production environments for one of the factories overseas, and it took us four months. And I said, wow, that must have been an awful lot of servers. And they said, yes, it was eight. <laughs> so when I joke about upgrading to mediocrity, you can see I wasn't really trying to improve on a very great position to start with. So what was the scope. I tried to capture as many of the bits that were in scope as possible. So I have to be able to create a test AD domain, and when I create one of those test environments, I use the domain controller as my file server for everything. It's just the infrastructure server. We need to be able to set up SQL, sometimes on clusters. We need to set up clustering for our applications, set up all the Windows apps, services, firewall, um, Installed quite a lot of PowerShell modules, not surprisingly. 
um, various utilities to make things helpful, uh, other management tools, and about a dozen um, of these apps from GE, plus sundry other bits and pieces. Um, you might, uh, we were joking at the start about my, my machines being on UK time. Um, actually, that's one of the requirements. We set up a server and it was on um, Pacific time. And the, uh, the, the um, business as usual people said, oh, we can't look after that. It's on the wrong time zone. So some of this stuff kind of creeps in. Now, I don't know if any, some of you must have been in Gail's session earlier, earlier on today. And he had a great quote, and I wish I'd written it down, about learning stuff as you go. And it was from the thing about agile is dead, long live agility. Um, that, puts, that puts this slide a lot better. But normally, as you get scope creep in the work that you're doing, that's a bad thing, because you're having to do more stuff, and you go, oh, no, you know, I've already over-promised what I can deliver in the time, because I suffer from optimism bias. And now, someone's giving me more stuff to do. Well, here, scope creep is good because all the things that you learn about the configuration, if you can get those into your centralized configuration, that's one less thing that might not be configured correctly. It's one less thing that somebody else on the team is RDPing into a server and manually configuring. Okay, so for me, that process of constant little refinements and learning about things that we've missed, that's actually a really positive thing. And that's kind of my, my take on, on being agile. But I'm always adding little pieces to this. Because somebody comes along and says, oh, could you just make sure that? And normally, anything that begins, could you just, is like, oh, no. Um, at, when I was at the Formula One team, we started referring to tasks as kibby tasks. C-I-B-Y. C-I-B-Y stands for can I borrow you, right? And kibby tasks were the things that killed every kind of planned work because somebody would come along and say, can I borrow you? I just need some help with this SQL Server. And you go, hang on, I'm supposed to be getting link working. Why are you asking me about SQL Server? So normally it's a bad thing. Here, I've, I've learned to embrace it. Oh. So, the mantra is basically, describe how it should be. Um, Henley node, by the way, if you notice the name, the other one was called Warwick node. These are, these are a pair, and I name my servers in my test environment after junctions as you drive up the motorway going to work. So, we're at Warwick, and then the next one up the road is Henley. Um, it, it's quite fun where you, when you get some motorway junctions where the names of places have got rude words buried in the middle of the name. Um, <laughs> So describe how it's supposed to be and isolate this from the code that does it. So you can see, we've got a statement here that's very much like what I showed you when I was starting the build process off. Then, well, I wouldn't be able to get through without at least one Star Trek reference. Make it so. And it doesn't stop there because you need to show that it's been done and how you did it. So you can see this is a snapshot from uh, an earlier version, but here I've gone through and I've run some tests to show everything was configured the way it was supposed to do. Now, just on DSC, I hear people talking about DSC in a particular way and it sets my teeth on edge. It's desired state. Not one setting, not a couple of settings, but it's everything. Okay? State is the sum of settings. Okay? Try saying that after a few drinks, especially if you have badly fitting teeth. Actually, going back to my family, my, my mother often talks about one of her school teachers who did have badly fitting false teeth. And so I like the idea of her saying state is the sum of settings. But I think if I do that for too long, I'll get stuck like it, and I'll have to do the rest of the session talking like that. So don't 
use DSC for just poking one thing in, okay? Because when you then go to the server and you say test DSC configuration, it shows you the last thing that it set. Right, so you set one registry entry. Well done. What were all the other settings? <laughs> so it's cumulative. Each additional thing gets a dish added to the one configuration, okay? That's important because it means you have to have somebody managing what that configuration is centrally. Oh, look, I managed to get another reference in there. Um, the thing for this environment was they didn't want anything that involved in the installing more agents onto computers. Um, they have an awful lot of firewall problems. Um, we can't actually connect to all the domain controllers in our domain because of firewall problems. So the idea of having pool servers on the network filled people with horror. And then they got me in to do the job. So it was going to be very heavily DSC. Now, was anybody in Jeff Hicks' session this morning on DSC modules? He talked a little bit about um, writing both the old style modules and the new style modules and having to write DSC resources to work with PowerShell 4. When I got to Jaguar Land Rover, I was actually having to use my laptop, uh, which has obviously been upgraded. Well, it's Windows 10, so it's PowerShell 5. And the servers had PowerShell 4 on them. So the first DSC things I tried to do did not work. Okay? I found that a MOF file can built on a, on a PowerShell 5 machine, that MOF file will not run on a PowerShell 4 machine. Now, there may be specifics in the MOF file that I was building, but I couldn't find what they were. So I then had to take my configuration and compile it on a PowerShell 4 machine. And then I found that actually things I was writing into configurations wouldn't compile on PowerShell 4 anyway. So the first decision that I made was, right, we're going to um, just make sure we upgrade to PowerShell 5. Um, that does complicate things, because the first thing I have to do with the pre-built machines is I have to upgrade PowerShell on them. And if I'm working with DSC, um, I've got a little bit of a bootstrapping problem there. So um, in the end, we went with that. One of the, one of the things that I, I was told and was, was part of the, the initial brief on the project was don't try and introduce too much new software. In, in fact, if you can in introduce no new software, that would be a plus. PowerShell wasn't seen, as, upgrading PowerShell wasn't seen as, as that. It was just a Windows patch, so that was okay. Um, and actually, being a Windows patch, complicates upgrading it even further. Now, the, the next decision was about separating the parameters and the logic. So I'll show you this. Um, don't try and read this as, as code too much because it's, it's just too small. It, it's too much of, a, of an optician's chart. But we have a configuration, and there are lots of ifs and loops in that configuration. Okay, So I have one big configuration that will set up a domain controller, SQL clustered or not, applications clustered or not, and uh, just a generic machine. That's when I talked about, oh my word, I built a monster. Okay. Um, the other thing, sometimes when you look at a configuration, you'll see that people have said, we want to install these Windows features. So you get 10 segments in the configuration that say, install this one, install this one, install this one. Well, I've said, take the, the features that you want added and removed, spin them out to the configuration file, and then just do a for loop to install each one. The, this kind of structure was what basically didn't, didn't work properly um, without PowerShell 5. Then the configuration data goes in its own file. So you can see here we can have simple values, arrays, hash tables, all sorts of bits and pieces. And then I run the configuration, and you just say, run it with that switch. Now, that will spit out a MOF file for each machine. And I then put those MOF files through a 
script called convert moth to pester. So I read one text file and I spit out PowerShell files at the other end. Um, I've become quite adept over the years at um, programs that write other, other programs, um, even to the point of writing PowerShell scripts that output Python programs. <laughs> I should have just learnt Python, it would have been easier. And when I talk about um, infrastructure as Excel, I actually read the Excel build sheets and spit out a configuration file. If I just drop out of the presentation for a second, go on. Last week, we built some servers um, in one of our sites. So here's the description of the servers we had to build. You can see it goes on a bit. Okay, but somebody gave me that which contains the IP addresses, the names, cluster names. They have this lovely naming convention, by the way, of naming the cluster after the first node in the cluster. And I, I struggle to understand that one, but there you go. We're, what disks we have, all of that stuff. So I read that and I crunch it, and what comes out looks like this. So that very first column in there was that machine, and those are all the settings that we're going to apply to it, okay? So you can see firewall rules in there, cluster name, cluster quorum disk, what type of, um, what type of quorum it's going to be, all of this stuff, okay? And that, I'm not sure that I can make the font bigger, but... Uh, yeah, you can see there's an awful lot of stuff goes into the parameter file. There are about 70 parameters, but firewall rules to add is one parameter, okay? So you can see in each firewall rule to add, there is one of these. So the, the uh, a firewall rule is a, um, is a hash table in this case. So that's what we actually get from the spreadsheet and the yeah ah very good question what am i using to get the settings from excel there is a very very good module out on the internet uh it's in the powershell gallery and you can get the latest version of github it's simply called import excel um and i've done some work to add to the export part of it um and basically, it allows you to read uh, XLS X files without having Excel on the computer. So it's brilliant to put on servers. But it also, um, I used parts of it to give me the effect of an Excel macro from PowerShell. So I could basically say, read down to here, because in this row, you've got all the machine names. And then you know that the, that if you read down the columns, you'll find the values for each of those machine names. So I, I used Import Excel to do it. Um, it's a wrapper for somebody else's uh, DLL that processes XLSX files. Uh, it's written by a guy called Doug Fink, who I can't speak highly enough of, um, but go and download it. From, if, you, if you only take one thing away from this session, getting Import Excel out of the PowerShell gallery wouldn't be a bad thing to learn. So the first, first decision we made was around um, PowerShell. The second one was enforcing this thing of separating the parameters and the logic and being able to just say, right, go and look for any files that are called config.ps1 and basically if you've got one of those that's been spat out, just add that to the nodes in the configuration. So we ended up with three core files. One of them is called um, DSC baseline. Um, I wasn't joking about the, the, the size of the MOF files, by the way. They typically have around about 100 configuration items in them. Uh, they're typically uh, a little over 1,000 lines. And here is the um, configuration itself. So if you just, again, I'll make the font a little bit bigger. Oh, did I not press escape? 
like that. Come on. So up here, I've got a definition of what all the parameters are that, that can be used. So you can see we've got node name and time zone, et cetera, all the way down. And then here, it's broken up into regions, but you can see we've got um, things that are generic, uh, are about 400 lines there. How to install a domain controller, how to install the different bits of the MES software. Um, that software in itself is quite painful to install because a lot of the installation relies on uh, response files being fed into a setup program, and those response files change from machine to machine. So I actually have a script resource in here which will, which will modify those response files so that they're appropriate to the machine that we're going on. So, for example, the name of the database server that they need to connect to gets written on the fly. So you can see here the uh, configuration starts at line 86 and ends at line 2025. So there's about 2,000 lines of actual configuration. I don't know if I, would, if I were taking this on again how I would break this up into smaller pieces. There are, th there are ways to do it. I wouldn't necessarily advocate making it one file like this. But the idea of one single configuration managed at, at one central point is one I'd, I'd stick to. So that was the first one. The next one is this thing called convert moth to pester. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, it reads a moth file and it spits out a pester test at the end of it. Um, I'll show you one of those uh, in a second. And then the last one is called Publish Moth and Tests. And again, does pretty much what it says on the tin. That sets up the configuration data, um, adds any files that I've exported from Excel, links up the machine certificates if they're there, and if we're building on things like Hyper-V, we might have configuration data for Hyper-V in the machine settings. So graphically, it looks like that. Logic in one file, description in another, out come the machine-specific files. Now, I noticed that everything's gone quiet and things have been running for about 30 minutes. I want to come back to this one later, actually. So over here, this is my SQL server. And you can see that it's run a set of pester tests. Let me make the, the font a little bit bigger. So you can see we've got all the, the basic things. These ones that are, the, this one in yellow, it said, don't try and check this one because you haven't got internet connectivity. Okay? So we haven't checked to see it. We don't check to see whether we've got up-to-date virus signatures. We don't check to see whether we're configured for NuGet because we're not uh, connected to the internet. But you can see We've checked that we, uh, we've got British Locale and Time Zone. We're registered to the right organization because we've got flack for not setting that on servers that were in Google Cloud. We've uh, installed Windows components and, so, and a select set of hotfixes. And then we installed SQL Server. And somewhere in here, it should say that we created a database. And I've obviously skipped that bit somewhere. Oh, there it is. So it created a database user called MesAdmin. It's created another one uh, based on the, on the local username. And it's created um, a database for the, uh, the Simplicity application. So we get all those checks as part of the uh, convert moth to pester. And if I edit this, just one thing that I'm really finicky about with pester the it statement in PESTA, the rest of it should read like a proper sentence. So it ensured that this is not installed. It ensured it installed this, and so on. So I'm, I can show that to somebody from management and say, look, these are the things that I'm checking. And it's kind of human readable. Well, it's management readable. Um, 
So that is all produced automatically based on the configuration file for the machine. So there's no, uh, th there's no James work gone into that. Now, building any sort of significant configuration, um, you would learn very quickly. Um, if you went to Mrs. Session yesterday afternoon, she had this great phrase about um, DSC being a toolkit, which meant that you could create your own tools with it, but the bad news was you had to. Well, yeah, that's, that's about the, the strength of it. There are lots of additional resources online, and what I've found is there were resources online that somehow or other I managed not to discover. So one or two of the resources that I created, I could, if I'd searched better, have found something that might have done the job. But some of the resources that you find, um, particularly on the PowerShell gallery, um, they have two faults. One is somebody was trying to solve a particular problem, so they covered the bit that they needed to cover. So there's a cluster module out there, but it doesn't create cluster groups or cluster resources. Some of them work in a perverse way. Um, the late Douglas Adams talked about, the, there was a Hitchhiker's Guide to, to the Galaxy computer game at one point, and he described the user interface of it as user mendacious. And I had to look up mendacious, but believe me, it's a wonderful way of saying it's the opposite of friendly. Um, some of the tools, SQL does it, but actually some of the AD ones do the same kind of thing. They assume that what you've put in your configuration is how something must be forever and ever. So you put a password in, that password is ever changed, it changes it back. Actually, the SQL one changes it not to back to the original password, but back to a secure string representation of the original password. <laughs> um, but the Active Directory Groups one, for example, will remove everybody that you haven't named from that AD group. So you want to add somebody to a group, well, you better know who else is in that group before you start. So some of these we had to rewrite, or I had to rewrite. So you're going to have to get used to the idea that you'll either need to adapt or create some resources. Now, Jeff's session on DSC resources this morning, he would say, if you know the PowerShell for it already, the good news is you're just about all the way there. The bad news is that you are probably thinking of one configuration path. And you will have to cope with more deviations off that path than you'd imagined. So, again, I don't want to dwell too much on this. If you want to know about um, classes, um, Mike Robbins has got a session in the, in the next time slot, I think, where he's talking about um, DSC classes. I heartily recommend that one. But basically, we provide a set of parameters. We've then got a get function, which returns something of this type. We've got a test function that says, do we need to do the set, which is the next bit? It's not just, is it in the desired state? But if it's not in the desired state, do we think we can get it there? Okay. Sometimes it's easier to, f to, to return, we're, we're as good as we're going to get from test, than say, no, we're not in the desired state, and then have the set part fail. And the set bit will, as I keep using, make it so. Really important, Jeff talked about this, and I've just put it here as well, absolutely pepper these, these classes with right verbose statements, because that's your clue as to what's going on. Now, I talked about things not following the happy path. One very simple one was that machine that I've just brought, brought up had a brand new disk in it that had, never, that had just been created before I started the machine. So what I want the machine to do, when it comes up, I want it to check that all the disks are online and formatted. So they've got to be initialized, partitioned, formatted, away we go. And that's great. The disk isn't online, or it's read-only. Oh, well, I better bring it online then. And then I started having to deal with clustering because there's another flag that you get on a disk object when you look at it that says, this disk is in a cluster and it's not online for you. The other node of the cluster has it. 
you can't bring it online. So now I've got to go back and change my code. So having initially gone, oh, I hadn't allowed for disks not being online, now I've said always put them online. Now I've got to say always put them online unless you're in a cluster. And then, of course, something fails somewhere along the line, and the disk's initialized but not partitioned, and I hadn't picked that up, or the drive letter's already in use, or the prize one of the lot. I thought everybody would format or um, initialize disks as GPT disks these days. So when I went to do stuff with clustering, I assumed everything was a GPT disk. Uh, offshore friends still partition everything or format everything or do everything as MBR disks. And the way that you find a disk in a cluster is completely different if it's an MBR disk compared with if it's a GPT disk. Oh, and don't expect your disks to, have cons to be consistent between one server and the next as to the disk ID. So that really simple thing that I started writing has ended up having to deal with all these other paths. And this is what I was saying earlier on about you learn more and more as you do this. It's an iterative process. You won't know it all at the beginning. You can't possibly. So you just add to it as you go. Some of the pitfalls with resources, um, you would hope that you could actually say at the start of the, the configuration, copy these files down because I'm going to need them later. No, the configuration has a look and says, you refer to these types and, oh, they don't exist. Bang, stop. Um, if you're using a pool server, and remember we, we, we said we couldn't use a pool server, there's a great opportunity to get something wrong by not updating the files on the pool server when you add something to the, the configuration. Um, I know people have fallen into that, that hole. Um, if we've got the same resource defined in two modules, you can't compile it. And if you've got two versions on the same server, when you go to apply the configuration, it says, you didn't specify which version to use, so I'm just going to abandon at this point. So we created the process to remove all copies of the modules that we used and make sure we copied on just one version. So we ended up with 12 modules, six from the PowerShell gallery, um, six that we built ourselves. Um, I replaced the failover cluster module. I actually did what Mike's describing in the session I was plugging before. And I wrote my own for managing disks, managing uh, the firewall, and one specific to this um, GE uh, software. Um, 45 resource classes in, in the configuration in total. Obviously, we use some classes over and over again. And there's about another 15 or 20 script items in there that we could turn into classes. So it becomes quite complex. In case you hadn't picked that up, by the way. So bootstrapping problems that we hit. Well, the first one I mentioned already was upgrading PowerShell. Um, if you try and apply a patch in a remote session, you'll actually see the, um, I forget what the, the letters stand for, but WUSA, which is the, the thing that applies patches, uh, starts and then very quickly logs an access denied message in the event log. Um, you can't um, apply a patch from a, from a remote PowerShell session. Uh, we needed to get all the resource files on. The other thing is, a lot of these things need credentials to be specified. They're going to be my credentials, unfortunately, and so I want them encrypted with the certificate. But how do I get a certificate from that machine initially? So we needed to sort that one out. So when we build on, on Hyper-V, I mount the VHD file, I create a, a machine-specific unattend.txt file and copy that in, I copy the other files that I need, and then the unattend.xml schedules a script called bootstrap DSC, and that runs at boot time. If I'm presented with a pre-built machine, I co connect to the C dollar share on it, and I run some commands in a PowerShell session. So the, the bootstrap process basically says, if you're not running PowerShell 5, schedule this program to run at boot time and yes, schedule this program to run at boot time and install PowerShell 5. Okay, at that point it, it exits. Okay, if we haven't got a certificate, create one 
and apply it and export it, which is the middle bit. And then finally, we can say, start DSC configuration. Now, one of the tricks that I use is I make sure there is no configuration to start if I'm expecting to create a certificate. So I can run this once, and it will create the certificate. I can run it a second time, and the configuration's there. And if it gets to the end, it can then say, remove that scheduled task. Uh, this is on 2012R2. If I can get it to 16, I'll have, I'll have achieved so many things. You can, but re remember anything that anything that starts it if you're in a if you're in a remote session. So I couldn't I couldn't use this particular piece of code push DSC, which is what you saw me run at the beginning. So this connects to the new machine. If necessary, it, it does that by IP address and specifying a set of credentials. It checks for the certificate. If the certificate is missing, then it copies files to the, to the machine and creates and exports the certificate, and you saw that happening. If we're running PowerShell before version 5, we schedule that bootstrap DSC to run and then run it. So we, we get around this. You can't run it as a, in the PowerShell session by running it as a scheduled task. And then while that's running, we copy the MOF file and the PESTA tests over to the machine if we didn't have to upgrade to PowerShell 5, we can then just start bootstrap.dsc. Uh, sorry, bootstrap.dsc.plus1. And the nodes get built with this set of PESTA tests. Um, so the PESTA tests are placed on the machine. I also have a script which parses the DSC logs. And I extract the stuff from the DSC logs and the PESTA results to an Excel file. There's a plug, by the way, for that import Excel module. So every node writes two pages to a workbook, and I've got more auditing that creates a workbook per machine. So let's just go back to my demo machine, because I wanted to save this for the end, and I reckon I'm just beginning to overrun. So here's my new machine. Let's go to log on to it. And the first thing that I notice is it's joined the domain called domain.local. And I've renamed the administrator to Summit. You notice that if I put the local administrator in, it says, oh, you want to log on to the local machine? No, I want to log on to the domain administrator because I'm drunk on the power. <laughs> My passwords, incidentally, have become lines from Monty Python sketches. I'm working with a lot of people who are rotated in from India. I'm trying to explain the Monty Python-based passwords is, is fun some days. <laughs> This grey screen tells me that I've never logged onto this machine before because when I log on, I get BG Info that does that. And it looks like I've got, oh look, I've got a failover cluster adapter, I've got a cluster IP address. And if I go to my programs, you can see I've got the General Electric license client, which was in the list of things. I've got Notepad++, which was in the list of things I wanted to install. So that all looks quite positive. And one thing that I've not got to the bottom of that I wish I understood is why the very first time you run PowerShell on a new server, you have to wait about a minute for it to actually become responsive. But I've got something that parses the JSON files that DSC leaves behind and turns them into PowerShell objects. And the minus grid there will make that a grid view. Yes? That's because the logic didn't see the bunch of stuff in the gap. Oh, okay. If you didn't hear that, that wait is because it's doing a bunch of stuff in the GAC. So that should have run that. So here I've got my view of what DSC has done. So you can see we saw when it was configuring itself, you notice the machine name on this side is, uh, is one of those randomly generated ones set the DNS, joined the domain, rebooted, did a load more stuff, okay? And 
what I can then do is I can run my pester scripts. What I'm actually going to do is do the pester script and send it to an Excel file. Now, because I'm slightly overrun, what I've got here is the one that I created on the other machines earlier on. So I'm just going to go to setup.xls. So this is what it looks like when it comes back. And the nice thing about this, uh, th this module of Doug's is that not a, it, it does more than exporting a CSV file. You can see that I've got filtering here, so I can say, just show me the, the failures. So you can see here, uh, this one failed to, to get new uh, antivirus signatures. Um, you can see also they're color coded. And what I've got here is a list of all the steps that, in this case, it's the, the domain controller that I've been running the demo from, all the steps that it went through and how long it took them to run. So I've got my proof that I've made it so, I've got my steps that I took to make it so, and I can hand that over to somebody. So I've now got closed this loop of actually being able to show how I got to where I am and, and where I am. So, what did we learn? Um, that last piece, the, the Excel piece, I, I'm going I'm to stand by really firmly. If you can't show what you've done, don't bother. Right? If, you, if you can show, oh, let's just say if you can't show. <laughs> when you come to download these slides afterwards, it will say you can't if you can't show. But it, ama it amazes me. You think of, you know, if, if you went to get on an aeroplane, and the maintenance log for that aeroplane was, was as good as your company's log of what it had done to the service. You wouldn't fly. <laughs> Yet, it's not something that's safety critical like that. If you check a parcel that's been sent from one side of the country to the other, you know every step that it took, and probably the name of the guy that delivered it to your house. And that's just for a parcel. Get as much into that config as you can. I think I've done the thing about it being more a platform than a tool to death by now. And the other thing that um, I learned was my code is surprisingly robust. Most of my errors when I set this stuff up is because I put the parameters in the parameter file wrong. The code, th that seems to be more of a problem than anything else. So that's it. Sorry for overrunning. Thank you for staying. <laughs>